university teacher and I am a MAG member um, involved in the organization of this IGF. And our workshop name is Steps Towards an Internet that it's multilingual and yet remains global. And first I would like to introduce our distinguished panelists that will be working with us in this working session during this one hour and a half time that we have. Uh, we have Mrs. Miriam Nisbet from UNESCO. Mrs. Nisbet, since uh, 2007, she's Director of Informa Information Society Division of UNESCO's Communication Information Sector. And prior to this uh, job, she was legal advisor to American Library Association and United States National Archives. We have Mr. Kusai Ashanti, he's deputy chairman of Q8 Information Technology Society. He's a member of the multi-stakeholder advisor group, so he's my, he's my, my pal fellow there. Uh, he's a computer engineer from George Washington University, and he has more than 15 years of experience in the internet industry. Then we have Mr. Rajesh Arawal. He's from NICSI, National Internet Exchange of India, and he also is involved in the operation of the .in registry, and he's also co-hosting this beautiful meeting of the IGF. Uh, we have uh, another panelist, Mr. David Apasami. He's executive, executive vice president of CFI Technologies and leading intern, uh, leading, leading, I'm sorry, this morning my English is horrible. A leading internet and network services provided in India. You know, my, my home language is Spanish, so maybe my English is not very good this morning. And Mr. David Bekele. He is a manager of the Africa Regional Bureau of ISOC, Internet Society, and uh, before this job, he was assistant professor at the Addis Abeba University in the Computer Sciences Professorship. So, uh, welcome everyone, welcome. Thank you very much to our panelists. I would like to start with a few remarks about the multilingualism panel that was held yesterday in the main session. And if you allow me, I would like just to make some remarks and, and share with you some notes I take from the main session uh, that could perhaps give us some food for thoughts for starting our discussion. And then we will go through the presentations of our panelists. Uh, we re reviewed yesterday that most of the next billion users will come from countries where English is not the main language, like India, for example. It is expected that 250 million of these next billion users will come from India, for example, where today there are 40 million users and 22 official, official languages and 2,000 dialects. The need of tools and hardware to handle different languages in the Internet then becomes relevant to include these next billion users. Dealing with multiple languages is a very complex situation, as we can see, and connectivity does not mean a lot if someone cannot access the content that he or she can find in the Internet. The mobile revolution must be also considered, especially taking in consideration the development of content to be used in these mobiles. IDNs, it's a, it's a great thing, it is evolving, but there must also be local content available with software applications that can handle not only written languages, but also video and sound in other languages and make this content available for others. There is an, a huge need for collaborative efforts and also the community motivation. It's a key element, it becomes relevant and I would I, I love a, a question that was addressed at the end of the panel that said, we should know what would people need from us, not only trying to give them solutions, but try to, to, to get the, the feeling of the people, what, re, what they really need from developers, what they really need from experts in the Internet. Uh, these important concepts were addressed yesterday, and the purpose of this workshop is to review concrete experiences from our panelists in their own uh, works and in their own uh, countries and languages experience to see uh, if we can share concrete uh, experiences about what is, what is happening, how can these experiences could be shared among uh, different areas and different countries. 
Uh, we also, especially prepared by Dawit, uh, who is organizing this workshop, um, we have some questions that we would like them to be considered by our panelists in their presentations, and that I, would, I want to share with you. Um, one of them is, what are the conditions that need to be met for language to establish a self-sustaining presence in the Internet, so that someone who only speaks that language can use the Internet? What are the top three non-ideans, not so technical issues uh, that, uh, that are challenges for the establishment of a self-sustainable presence of a language on the internet? For example, economic issues, social aspects, political aspects, involvement of, of the community. Who are the major players for the development of a presence of a language in the internet? It's the community, it's the universities, it's uh, it's, it's the development of a strategy, what can they contribute and how? What are this, the lessons to be drawn from languages that have created a self-sustaining presence on the internet in the past decade? We heard yesterday the presentation from Manal. I was really very impressed that the, the, the Arab countries have made such a progress in being together. I think that she gave us an ex excellent collaborative uh, example of how, how different uh, a multi-stakeholder approach can be made to to make such an, a, a great effort towards the presence of the Arab language in the internet. And finally, what tools and what support would be the most useful uh, thing to be used for the linguistic communities that try to create a sustainable presence of their language, languages on the internet? Uh, having said so, unfortunately, I cannot look at the faces of the people sitting in the right side of the, of the room. Um, but um, I will give the floor to our first panelist, uh, Mr. Kusai Ashanti. Uh, Kusai, do you have a, a PowerPoint presentation? Yes, you want to go to the podium? Sure. Um, earlier, but with uh, respect of the uh, Arab world and the Arab language. Um, the first question was one talks about the conditions needed for a language to have a sustainable presence. Really, from our experience, uh, the first maybe, if our language doesn't have a script and it's not codified, then we are in the first square. We need to have the script and we need to have it codified. Not only that, we need to be part of a standard. Let me reflect on an experience. In the mid-90s, we have attempts to publish Arabic text on the web. And we have two attempts a browser called Alice, and a browser called Sindbad. And uh, they are all related to the Arab world. But each of them use their own way. So if I wrote text in Al for Alice, the Sindbad browser will not read it. And this, if, I, uh, if I wrote text for the Sindbad browser, the Alice browser did not read it. And so we did not have a solution for Arabic text. If you are familiar with Arabic, and Arabic was there, suddenly we can use Explorer, Netscape, for, uh, Firefox, all with the same text scripting and codified. So that's all the problem. Two, openness to information. Whether it is syndicated information or user-generated information, the availability and the will to produce it should be there, and one of the key reasons that drives that is openness to information. Three, the freedom of expression. The net for us in the Arab world was mainly expressing yourself, breaking the social barrier, breaking the economical barrier. Uh, it was these conditions that help in producing and creating texts. And this is why I'll put, I have put two and three as content generation factors, mainly. For access, as we all heard yesterday in the uh, panel discussion, content drives access demand, and vice versa, access drives content demand. Five, the user. Basically, he is the demand. The user is the demand for the net. And he is the content generator at the end. 
When we come to challenges for the establishment of self-sustainable presence of a new language on the internet, I know uh, Olga mentioned the top three, but I will add a four. First, it was the global trend. At the beginning, when internet was purely an English environment, uh, it was limited in our part of the world to the technical community and mainly people who knows English and some of the elite business conduct. Uh, but everybody knew about the internet and it's a powerful thing, but we cannot use it. Uh, we need to use it. So the awareness of the global trend was a major factor in attempt to put Arabic into the internet. The other issue was the preservation of identity and culture. Yes, it's an issue for us. If the other cultures, other societies, other civilization are using the cyberspace to have a sustainable presence, to present themselves, to offer ideas about their culture and the way of living, we need to follow and we need to cope with that and be on the same level. And that's another factor. Three, outreach. It is important for us and to know that the internet is, the, is a mean to outreach others, is to outreach other communities, is to outreach other people. It's not a clash of civilization. It's not a threat as someone may perceive. No, it's an outreach and it's a communication and it's a knowledge and information sharing environment. And if we thought it that way, we will establish our presence. I added the content tools because it's a still an issue for us in the Arab world in, in, in a specific uh, aspect that I'll come later. But it is a challenge for any script or any language if they don't have the proper content tools. Now, who are the major players for the development of a presence of a language on the internet? In our part of the world, really content-driven service-oriented enterprises or entrepreneurships were the key factors into uh, putting Arabic content on the net. Online banking was a major drive for Arabic content to be on the net. Day trading was another factor. Uh, the fact that uh, mobile companies, uh, the fact that they needed to create content to generate business. Uh, the ISPs who wanted also content to be on the net to generate traffic. So content-driven and service-oriented enterprises and entrepreneurships were main factors. The online community. We, uh, the online community, and I mean here mainly online applications. We all, many of us today use Google Docs. For example, it's an online web processing spreadsheet application and we are using it. Many of us are using online translators. So this is a major uh, uh, player. Three and four, I will interrelate them, but software industry does not look at self open source and open source, they don't look at self as software industry, but we are of course talking about the same issue, the availability of software that, uh, that we can install on desktop or servers and can be a content generating tool for us. What are the lessons learned, let's say, from the languages that have created the self-sustaining process on the internet? Learning from others and how they, they cope with the internet and cyberspace, we know that a collaborative effort among all stakeholders is the right way to do it. Uh, we all heard, we all yesterday heard about Manal and what she said about the Arabic script group that we have in the Arabic world and this group is working effectively, self-regulating and organizing itself and they are doing a wonderful job. So a, col a collaborative effort among all stakeholders is one of the lessons that we learned. Allow others to help. We should not say that we in the Arab world we know about Arabic language the best and forget about the other cultures or people coming from other part of the world. No. Uh, other part of the world, the global software industry, the global IT industry, there are all people with capability and knowledge that can help us in putting scripts online. Preservation, communication, and not isolation. And again, we want to be on the net because we want to preserve our heritage, culture, and identity. And we want eventually to communicate with other people and outreach them. 
with, but what we don't want to be is isolated and create an isolated, closed community. And that are some communities that still exist with Latin languages that we cannot do with Arabic languages. It is in that respect, really, that we need to have the loc to localize the content tools and the online application. Three, the mobile tools. Uh, the mobile is the next frontier of the internet if it's not today the major frontier of the internet. Um, we, are, we still lack within mobile applications. We need to develop more tools and, and to have a variety of content producing application on the mobile uh, uh, platform to enrich, let's say, the Arabic content on the web. Sorry to take long. Uh, thank you. Um, there we have the computer. <laughs> we don't have a whole PowerPoint uh, presentation. Uh, what I would like to do is talk just a little bit about um, the ways that UNESCO works in trying to promote multilingualism. Um, <clears throat> I'm really going to point out sort of two, two particular, I don't Um, endangered languages to help preserve them, um, but we're going to we're going to end with that. I'm going to give you a little bit of information. Let me see. Bear with me. Where I work, I'm head of the Information Society Division. We have several um, efforts that I, I'll just mention to you so you're aware of. Uh, and then there's our culture sector, which works, as I said, particularly on um, promoting 2008, which is Year of the Languages, uh, endangered languages, working with uh, indigenous people, uh, particularly with their languages. So I'm going to touch on both aspects of those. How many of you were uh, able to be in the session yesterday morning on multi, multilingualism? A few, a few of you, at least. Um, does everybody know when we talk about IDNs and internationalized domain names, does, every, does everybody have a sense of what that is? This is an audience that would be extremely well versed in that, but I, it's always nice to know whether or not you're talking a, a strange language. Um, I'm not going to get into particularly those issues and the technicalities of how um, uh, the internationalized domain names are going to be rolled out. Uh, it's a major focus, obviously, of ICANN. It's uh, t being talked about in a number of different workshops here. What I want to just mention so you'll be aware of it is a, a, just a, a part that UNESCO is playing in that effort is that um, as the names, as the domain names are chosen, particularly by at the country code level uh, by governments, uh, we are committed to um, working with and we're already trying to figure out how to best do this with ICANN is to provide linguistic experts. Uh, that's something that uh, we, we know a lot about at UNESCO as the UN Educational uh, scientific and cultural organization. Um, we will providing, be providing linguistic experts as needed to help resolve perhaps issues that might come up with regard to scripts that are chosen to be in this fast track process. So that's one way that we're going to be uh, helping uh, and being involved in the process. What the other piece of what we do in the communication and information sector is what I would call capacity building. Um, and we, what we do is, in several ways, work particularly with communities to, um, to help build capacity 
in a number of different ways, um, particularly using technology, as you would imagine, the communication and information sector uh, would be very interested in that. Um, but we have several um, efforts that particularly relate to and are relevant to the multilingualism um, aspect. I'm going to just hit on a couple of those real quickly. Um, this is a real important one. One of the things that we do is we really um, work in different ways to provide support for libraries and archives. And um, among the things that we do, in, in addition to actually trying to really get them up and running or sustain them or help them upgrade, um, particularly in developing countries, is that we provide um, um, training, equipment, capacity building, and preservation and digitization programs. Um, uh, I think that the whole, <laughs> the whole um, mantra of content, content, content that you hear all the time with regard to multilingualism on the internet really ties directly to this effort, um, and that is if there is not content available in local languages for people to use and access in their communities, um, you know, it's the whole chicken and egg thing. Uh, you may have access, you may have connectivity, but if there's no content there, people are not really going to uh, take advantage of it. Particularly in communities where we're talking about uh, materials that are really of vital interest to the, to the community, to the region, uh, to the state, to the country. Um, we're, we're, we have vital resources here in libraries and archives. Um, those are materials that can be used um, by the general public. They can be used for research and scholarship. They can be used in school programs, in the, in the primary schools, or they could be used in the universities. So we're talking about really, really rich content that if only it can be um, made available and easily accessible by people, um, that makes a big difference. The last point you're going to see here, which is information literacy, is another important um, effort that we make, and that is to be sure that people actually can, you know, once, once they are trained and able to use technology, um, to be able to use the information in really creative ways, to be able to build on it, to create their own materials, to disseminate it further, to share it with people. Um, those, are, those are really critical. I'm just going to flip through a few things real quickly here. Um, another way that we, that we work as well, and I'm going to get to a couple of specific programs that are really labeled as multilingual, but I'm going to mention again um, another effort that we do is, um, is to establish what are called community media centers or community learning centers. And sometimes those can be combined with public libraries or uh, set up in schools for after hours, or they can be their own, um, their own areas, their own place, their own space, um, to use uh, both traditional media, for example, to establish radio stations in communities. Uh, still a very critical way of communicating. We all tend to think here, particularly at the uh, uh, at the IGF, we uh, we all think uh, computers. We all think um, uh, we're thinking more and more about mobile devices, certainly. But um, radio and television are still really important, particularly in areas that simply do not have that connectivity. So community media centers, community learning centers, again, a place that people can go to use equipment, they can get training, they can get access to these local materials as well. That's really important. And then the last thing I'm going to mention from the communication and information sector are, are some specific um, efforts, initiatives that we have. I've already um, mentioned one of these, which is the internationalized domain names. That's a little piece of what we're doing to support that, that effort. Uh, but we also have other specific um, um, programs that are really focused on local languages and particularly endangered languages. 
one thing that was mentioned um, yesterday and was also just mentioned um, this morning uh, is really the, the whole issue of how people are able to get access through tools. Uh, another thing that we do is very much uh, support various open access, open source, open educational resources. Again, that's another way that uh, particularly developing countries um, are, are able to work a little bit. Okay, I'm going to, ah, the open training platform, just so you'll be aware of it. This is a resource that we, um, that we have that provides training materials on all different kinds of, of areas, all different, um, and, and in different languages as well. Again, that's a content, that's definitely a content, it's also capacity building. Okay, I want to escape this and <clears throat> just quickly show you our, this is a web page from our culture sector. And as you will see, um, the focus is on the International Year of Languages and um, the, big, the big byline there is Languages Matter. <clears throat> this is um, another part of UNESCO. Uh, we work closely the communication and information sector with them. But if you, if you have a chance, I would love for you to go and look at some of the materials. They're quite um, extensive on this website showing a number of activities that we're involved in. Uh, again, particularly working on uh, endangered languages, um, endangered cultures, intangible heritage, um, those kinds of, of things. And um, I can tell you from working closely with the culture sector that we have really uh, dedicated people who believe passionately in the importance of ensuring that people can access material in their own language, can communicate with them, preserve them in all different kinds of ways. And um, I, I hope you will help us be part of that. Thank you. Oh, so you will speak from your, yeah. from your place there? OK. Oh, oh, you want to move to the podium? I can go back okay. to the podium. OK, great. So you can see better all the people. See half of, of the, of the public. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Okay. So there is an unfortunate impression that most of the Indians speak English because most of those who have who interact with outsiders, they are from institutes and organizations and backgrounds where English is quite common. In a sense, this 10, 15 percent English speaking Indians have helped build the economy, especially in the IT sector. Last year we had exports of software exports of more than $40 billion, and a lot of BPO and of even knowledge processing industries are coming here. But English is restricted to 15% of our population. So roughly 1 billion of our population does not speak English. This has two components. One is our entire higher education is mostly in English. And there is an effort to introduce English at schooling levels also. But second interesting factor which we see is that while Indians aspire to learn English, most of the big organizations, multinationals, movie moguls, they understand that the market is out there with non-English speaking people. So when Spider-Man gets released in India, more than English theaters, it's the translated version in Bhojpuri and Hindi, which is more sold out. So that's a very recent phenomena where people understand the market power, that the market lies in our hinterlands, where our local languages 
are important. We have about more than 1,500 languages. In the 2001 census, they started counting major languages, and they stopped at about 700. Then they got bored. At the official level, we have English plus 22 Indian languages. The use of Indian languages on the computers started right from 1980s. Whenever desktop publishing industry uh, and newspapers, etc., they shifted to computerized methods of working. So we saw a hardware methods like gist cards and a lot of font-based solutions. So most of the packages, earlier it was Worldstar and Lotus, etc., 123, etc., and later on other packages. People developed solutions so that those packages could be used with Indian languages. But it was mainly restricted to font-based kind of solutions. Recently, we see more dedicated localization efforts, both from the government side, as well as small startups in India, as well as big organizations like Microsoft, Google, etc. So localization is happening at various levels. You see Microsoft Windows now available in 13 Indian languages. The operating system, all the commands, the Internet Explorer, so you can use in Indian languages. Then open source solutions, the community is doing a lot of work. Commercial Linux packages like Red Hat, SUSE Linux, they are now available in a dozen Indian languages. Then on KDE and Genome, you have reasonably good localization packages in six, seven languages. OpenOffice.org, it's available in three, four Indian languages. So localization is happening on that front. Now on the content side, as, well, as far as internet is concerned, we still don't see too many Indian languages on the internet. We are nowhere in the top 10 languages on the internet. While at least three, four of our languages should be there. So that's one part where we need to move very fast. It's happening in the blogging world, more than the commercial websites or official websites. We have now more than tens of thousands of blogs in Hindi, Telugu, Tamil, Malayalam. And then we have languages like Punjabi, Bengali, Gujarati, represented quite well in the blogging world. But still, we have a lot of issues on the content. Till last year, I was there in the Election Commission of India for about four years. I started working with India's voter lists. We had more than 700 million voters. And we had the list in 15 Indian languages, including English and Urdu. I wanted to put it on the internet so that people could search their names. And we found that the lists were in more than 200 fonts. Now, converting fonts into un First, we tried to put those fonts on the internet. So working with downloadable fonts, or embedding the fonts into PDF files or something like that, or trying EOT methods, then trying converting into Unicode, we found that 70, 80% fonts we could reasonably well convert into Unicode, maybe with small cleaning scripts. But 10, 15% fonts, we really were quite badly stuck. And we had to work with, find who wrote those uh, font tables, work with those developers, and try to find solutions. In Urdu, we had an interesting uh, thing that we had to use Arabic Unicode pages. And uh, our people are more attuned to nastalic fonts. So we had to work, uh, develop something for that also. Then we found that uh, when we try to use text to speech and speech to text, only in two, three Indian languages, we found reasonably good tools. So that's another area we, we need to work on, really. Then in OCR, we find we're, we're very far behind. So 80% accuracy in OCR uh, does not take us anywhere. So in many languages, people claim 90% accuracy, 85% accuracy. 
But when it comes to really using that as a product, all of you know that it's not really usable at those levels of accuracy. So that's a scenario in the software scene, on the internet scene, as far as Indian languages are concerned. Uh, we are quite excited about the introduction of IDN, but as I explained, the operating systems, the content, that is the bulk of the issue. Uh, IDN can be an icing on the cake, it's not the whole cake. And IDN also, choosing one language to start with is very difficult for us. It becomes a politically sensitive issue, so choosing one language to start with. So maybe we'll start with six, seven languages. The prominent languages where the Unicode tables are clean, they, are, they really take care of all the issues of our languages. Uh, and see how it develop, uh, how it uh, generates a new interest in the names. Though I still feel that content is much more important than, than introduction of IDN and development of tools like OCR, text-to-speech. So that's where we need to work on. Uh, I will stop here, then maybe we'll take some questions on these issues. And once again, a big thank you from our heart, because we worked very hard for this meeting. And it was heartbreaking to see the Mumbai incident happening just before this. But luckily, the dropouts are less than 10%, and we are very thankful to all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Meeting, and we are very glad to be here in India. I think it's a perfect country to review all these issues. Um, David, it's our next speaker. Do you have a PowerPoint, or oh, you no, want to go to the podium? Thank okay. Thank you. You're welcome to to start. Yes. Okay. <coughs> It's uh, quite fortuitous that we are having this workshop on multilingualism in India. You heard yesterday that we have 22 languages, some 2,000 dialects, and so on. The reality is that every state is like a country on its own, in the sense that you have an ethnic group which has its own language, culture, mores, cuisine, and so on. So we are more like the European common market, so to speak, but then we have the complexity of languages. I'm sure that most of you, in fact all of you, uh, probably have Indian rupees in your wallet just now. And if you take them out and have a look at them, you'll find that the denomination of the rupee note will be written in 15 Indian languages on every single note, because there are 15 official languages. That's the complexity of India. Now, this is the backdrop that I'd like, to, like you to keep in mind while I run through the questions that uh, David had so kindly sent us. I don't have a PowerPoint, but I'll seek to address each question by first reading out the question and then talking about it in the Indian context to some extent. The first question was, what are the conditions that need to be met for a language to establish a self-sustaining presence on the internet? So someone who only speaks that language can use the internet. Well, if you look at that, I would believe that first the language would have to have a large enough population for it to be a living language, you know, for, for the language to be able to sustain itself, to evolve, to grow, to develop. The language would have to have a script and, of course, a large enough group of people who use it on a daily basis. If you look at it in the Indian context, this is true of every state, so we do have uh, the ability to be able to sustain those languages. <coughs> the other thing that I'd like you to keep in mind is that the print media, the offline media, is usually a very good metric of how well the language is doing. And in India, every state has newspapers and magazines in those languages which are thriving. Uh, very often, and more often than not, the language paper has a far higher circulation and readership than the English paper in every state. That's because the number of people who are really proficient in English in India out of a population of 1.1 billion is only about a little over 100 million. And even if a person reads an English newspaper, if you visit their home, more, it's more likely that they would have an English newspaper and a language newspaper. 
This is the reality of India. So the print media is usually a very good metric to see if it's a language that is thriving. Then, of course, in terms of its ability to sustain itself on the internet, as you heard just now, we need to have a Unicode system, a publishing system, which makes it possible to be online. And, and we need, a, along with the Unicode, we need a standardized keyboard. These, I would believe, would be the factors that, do, that would help ensure that it has a life online. The Unicode system, of course, would mean that it has a font or a script that one can actually put onto the internet. This would be true of most of the languages, the main languages in India. The second question is, what are the three, the top three non-IDN, for example, economic, social, and political challenges for the establishment of a self-sustainable presence of a new language on the internet? In considering this, one of the things that came to mind was that yes, it would have to be a living language that's used in daily life and is also a medium of education. If it's not a language that is in practice, it is not going, going to be established itself uh, you know, in a self-sustaining manner on the internet. It must be something that's used in daily life and it must be something that is a medium of education. Here again, you'll find that each state has a language that fits these criteria. The second, you know, I'm, I'm talking about the Indian context, but you can relate from a global point of view as well. The second point that came to mind is that there must be political freedom for the language's use. There must be political freedom for the language's use. Otherwise, it's going to be very difficult for it to get the right kind of backing to establish a presence on the internet. The third reason that came to mind is that the language would have to have sufficient scale and it would have to have a large enough population with a socioeconomic means, including academia, to be able to establish itself on the internet. The third question that was posed by David was who are the major players for the development of the presence of a language on the internet? What can they contribute and how? Well, in India, the major player has been the government. We heard yesterday, I think that's Mr. Ramakrishnan from the Center for Development of Advanced Computing who's here. You heard from him as to how many languages have been, you know, that they have released a Unicode system for or a publishing platform for. Uh, how many of the Indian languages now have it because of CDAC, which is the Center for Development of Advanced Computing. You've heard from Rajesh about the efforts of the government of India to establish most of the languages on the internet. So the government has been at the forefront. Next has been academia, the many universities who are trying to put up literature on the internet, who are translating important works in the local languages and putting them up on the internet. Then we have the example of Wikipedia, where we have the wiki open communities, where a lot of the technical community are working to establish the presence of Indian languages on the internet. For example, we have a site called swecha.org, uh, which has built tools around Telugu, such as publishing tools, an operating system in Telugu, in fact, the entire stack for computing. There are others as well. Wikipedia itself is a good example of uh, content in local languages. You'll find, um, I think, a couple of Indian languages there. Now we're finding that language-enabled search is becoming something that is helping the advancement of language content on the internet. We know that Google is working on search in at least six Indian languages. And uh, Yahoo is also working on um, search in Indian languages. And locally, we have a search engine called Guruji that also works in languages. There are also tools for uh, email in 14 Indian languages that are available in India today. I talked about universities earlier. They also play a major role in terms of helping with regard to Unicode, 
to font standardization to keyboard standardization and so on. Online portals and the media in terms of um, the, the offline publications that are talked about, the newspapers and magazines, are also doing a lot of work in terms of content on the internet and most of them, most of the major offline newspapers and magazines today are available online in the local language. The first Indian portal to make available, first Indian horizontal portal to make available, uh, their portal in six Indian languages was sophie.com from my company. And we have had the portal available in six languages for the last four years or so. And I'm happy to tell you that there are online communities from, communities from across the world, particularly in Tamil and Telugu, who use the language versions of our portal very extensively. The next question was, what are the lessons to be drawn for the languages that have created a self-sustaining presence on the internet in the past decade? Languages other than English. I think if you look at Indian languages, it is really Hindi, Tamil, Telugu, Kannada, Malayalam, and so on, which have been at the forefront. We find that popular content is really what drives the presence uh, of the language on the internet. I'm, I'm speaking about other than government and academia, uh, where the government has worked very hard to ensure that to provide a base in terms of getting the language onto the net, both from the point of view of e-governance, land records, and all of that. Academia we have seen in terms of literature and other educational content. But if you look at what makes it self-sustaining, where people can use it, we've heard time and again about uh, social networks, about user-generated content, and we find it's really popular content that is driving a lot of the use of the language on the internet. Uh, this is around entertainment, it is around news, it is around um, you know, uh, movies and music and so on and so forth. In fact, the last to really gain traction uh, is the truly literary content, which is used by people who are interested in literature and the language, which perhaps would be a bit of a niche. The last question is, what tools would be most useful for the linguistic communities that try to create a sustainable presence of the languages on the internet? And I think this has already been covered by most of the speakers, starting with Unicode publishing system and ending with IDNs, which will help actually propagate the language on the internet. I hope this has been useful. I've tried to use an Indian context to paint a larger picture, but I'm hoping that all of you could relate in terms of your own language. Thank you very much. Hello. Thank you very much, David. Very interesting presentation. And now we have our last speaker. Um, our and I am from Ethiopia, uh, a country that is uh, also very diverse, which has a lot of languages. And also uh, the only uh, African country with uh, its uh, own script, which makes things unique, but also sometimes difficult. Uh, I have some notes uh, that I have converted quickly to a PowerPoint presentation as soon as I heard that it's possible to have a presentation, so I may not follow it, uh, and it may be a little bit uh, not well done, but uh, I hope that, uh, uh, anyway, I will have to go quickly since we don't have much time, and many of what I, I have to say have been already said. Uh, until uh, recently, Internet was really an English medium uh, tool. 70% uh, of Internet users used English to access it until as late as 2004, uh, according to some statistics. But this is changing uh, now. 70% uh, of uh, users use other languages, especially Chinese, uh, uh, Japanese, French, German, etc. Uh, so it's in fact, internet is becoming more and more multilingual, uh, but still 10% uh, of, uh, no, 10 languages only uh, of, the, uh, of the world account for almost 85% of all users, 
while there are some people who, whose m uh, main language may not be English, but who use English, so it's very difficult to really to uh, use the statistics, but we can say overall that 10 languages are used uh, by 85% of uh, the world internet users, uh, which means that uh, the other almost 6,000 languages are practically not represented on the internet. So there are uh, uh, billions of people who cannot really access the internet because of language barrier, because uh, as uh, I think it was uh, Rajesh uh, said, uh, even though we say India is uh, an English-speaking uh, country, only 10, 15 percent uh, of the population speak English. This is true in Africa. In Africa, people say that Kenya is uh, an English-speaking country or Cameroon is a French-speaking country. But in fact, only a small percentage of the population speaks uh, that language. This is even more true in Ethiopia, where even though English is used by some la people, the majority of the population doesn't speak English at all. Uh, so unless we do something about it, then we will have, we may mm, have a better infrastructure, a better uh, physical access to the internet, but there will still be a lot of people around the world who will never be able to access the internet and to re reap the benefits that we can get from the internet. So how can we get internet more multilingual? Uh, it's very difficult, as I'm going to explain, and as the panelists have already explained because of many complicated problems, but I am quite optimistic that uh, as we go along, we are going to solve those problems and internet will, uh, well, many languages will be on the internet. Let me start by uh, talking about some of the problems uh, that have already been uh, cited, the social problems. Uh, in Africa, most languages do not have writing system. And even if they have them, most of the population do not, uh, do not know them because they have not been uh, educated in those languages. They are educated in French or English, for instance. Uh, illiteracy, uh, if in spite of a lot of efforts that have been done by UNESCO, for instance, uh, to improve this situation in many countries, uh, illiteracy is still rampant. Uh, and uh, some language resources, uh, no terminology for computing terms. So this is important uh, when we do localization, for instance. I know that uh, in Ethiopia we tried to uh, develop a terminology and it required a lot of resources and uh, it's very difficult even to implement once the terminologies have been um, uh, developed. There are economic uh, issues. Uh, I think uh, David talked about uh, the need to have a large population speaking that language. And there are unfortunately some languages uh, uh, like uh, those classified as endangered by UNESCO that are spoken by a few people. Uh, I know languages in Ethiopia that are spoken just uh, in one or two villages. Uh, how can we put these languages on the internet? Because there aren't even many speakers on the ground. So that's difficult. Uh, there are economic issues. Uh, there are some languages that may be spoken by millions of people, tens of millions of people, but that are not economically interesting because those people do not have a lot of GDP uh, and they won't be able to purchase uh, things on the internet. They are not interesting for the private sector, which we said is a major player here. There are some political issues. Uh, there are, fortunately, more and more countries are open to recognize uh, local languages, the importance of local languages. In Africa, um, some, a few years ago, it was really taboo to talk about local languages because we were afraid of the 
implications of instability that can create, etc. But now, well, a lot of constitutions, including the Ethiopian constitution, recognize uh, that people can speak in their own languages. There are uh, countries like South Africa, where there are 11 official languages. India has 22. So the, this is going in the right direction from my point of view. But there are countries where it is banned to speak your language, uh, where you have to speak the official language. And uh, you can't even, you have, uh, I don't cite a name, but there are languages where you have to change your name because it is not in the language of the official, in the official language. So uh, there are still some problems. Uh, there are some languages that are spoken across borders. This is especially true in Africa where borders are really artificial that are created by uh, the colonial powers some years ago. If you take uh, Tigrinya, which is spoken in the northern part of Ethiopia, it is also the national language in Eritrea, and these two countries are at war. How can we work together to develop, uh, for example, uh, some standards uh, with regards to Tigrinya. That's a major issue. That's not only in Ethiopia. I know that in the Balkans uh, there are uh, some countries that may not go well along that uh, share uh, some languages. Uh, this is true in most African uh, countries. There are some technical issues. Uh, Unicode has been mentioned and fortunately this is being solved thanks to uh, the effort of some people, especially, uh, uh, and keyboard standards. It may seem very simple, but it's important because uh, in the case of Ethiopia, we didn't have a keyboard standard until recently, and I have to admit that I don't like that much writing uh, in my own language on the, internet, on the computer because whenever I change a computer, I have to change uh, a keyboard, which is uh, not comforting. So uh, I generally give it to a secretary who types it for me uh, on the software that she likes uh, because uh, it's complicated. Uh, but even once we have a standard, it's not adopted yet by everybody. Uh, and uh, because of that, we still have the same problem. Uh, I think many of you have talked about uh, localization of softwares because if we don't have the software in our local language, then if we have to use uh, English or French or Spanish to operate the computer, then we have to be literate in those languages, which means that it's still reserved for people who want to use their language as a second language, and they have to know. This is an important thing, and it requires a lot of effort. Uh, Microsoft, for instance, has tried to localize Windows uh, in some African languages, but uh, at least for Amharic, I know that it's uh, since, I think, 2003 or something, but it's still not there. Uh, because of uh, because it requires a lot of resources and mm, well, Microsoft may not be that much interested in Ethiopia, which is one of the poorest countries in the world. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of issues that mm, that come here together. Uh, some technical issues, search engines. Nowadays, people really like to use the internet. Uh, using search engines. Uh, I think if you have content that is not searchable, uh, then it is really not very practical uh, to, uh, to, to use it. Uh, optical character recognition. Uh, many of uh, the, the other panelists have said that uh, it's important also to take, uh, well, the, the printed information can be made available online. I think especially in the beginning, that is how we can develop content in one language. But uh, if we have to type everything, I don't think we can go very far. And it's very important that we have optical character recognition for um, every script. Uh, but unfortunately, it requires a lot of researches. And as uh, it has been said, if we don't have good accuracy, then it's uh, really not uh, very useful. Uh, we have very good 
optical character recognition for Latin uh, script, but uh, unfortunately not for many other uh, scripts. The translation services, uh, speech to text translation, uh, or vice versa, that are very important. And uh, there is also the need to have technical capacity in developing content online in local languages. Uh, for instance, in Ethiopia, the official language or the, of the federal government uh, and the Addis Ababa government is Amharic. And you find any printed publication in Amharic. But if you go to their websites, you find it in English, even though English is not really the official language. Uh, why? Because the technical people decide that it's easier to develop things uh, in uh, English and nobody asks. So uh, we have to build the capacity of uh, the technical people in this area. Uh, Due to these challenges, there is an acute lack of content and applications in most languages of the world. Uh, application and content, as uh, it has been said, are very important. Uh, unless you don't have content and application, access is useless. And we need to have them in the local languages. Uh, as I think David mentioned, if we don't have content on paper, for example, if we don't have literature, if we don't have uh, uh, newspapers in th that language, it's very unlikely that that language will strive on the internet. So in fact, we cannot really say that we can develop that language on the internet. It has to go in the real life as well. Uh, so uh, languages should be developed, uh, should be promoted in schools, in uh, Administrations, we have to use uh, language in administrations in order to be able to have them on the, uh, online. Uh, 